Okay, so in this recording, we are going to go over how to kind of build out a rudimentary site model. And what we have in front of us right now is a DWG that we downloaded. Uh, this started life as a PDF from the PADCNR website. This is of uh, Camelback Mountain and the Big Pocono State Forest State Park. Um, we've downloaded it, looked at it in, in Illustrator, saved it as a DWG file, and opened it in here. Uh, we have made sure that it our Rhino file is in feet, and we have scaled it up to match the visual scale that's on the map. Now, different maps on the PADC and our, our website look differently. So your map that you use may be 500 feet as the max. It might be 5,000 feet as the max. So be careful and make sure that you get it in there and scale it up real carefully. Uh, this rectangle is just a vestige that we had on there, um, just to check that we were at the right scale. And just grab those and close those. Okay, so this PADCNR uh, map came in, we're at about four megabytes for the size of this file. And you can see that when I select it, it, got, it has all of the information on here. Now I could use explode and that would blow it into probably several thousand parts, but really we're just gonna use this as a reference. So we wanna be able to snap to it and look at it. We have it on its own layer and I'm gonna lock it. And by locking it, that way I can snap to it, but it won't change it. I won't accidentally grab it. And since it's made out of so many parts, that's really important so that I don't accidentally move it and then fling it 200 feet in the wrong direction. Now, previously, we had identified this lower loop trail as where we were going to kind of look at as a site for our project. We already have north, uh, north is uh, up on this map, so we don't have to adjust it any further. Uh, we noted before that this site by the north trail lower loop overlooks these, um, catchment ponds and wetland that's here. Um, it overlooks another overlook, and so it looks up at another overlook at the top of the mountain. And it and it, we kind of generally want to face west and south from this site, not east where Interstate 80 is. So we're going to focus on, not on building the entirety of this map, but we're going to focus on building this area in a little bit more detail and reference. And perhaps some of the view sheds or the areas that this site can see. What we're not gonna spend time doing is, is building stuff that the site doesn't look at. So we're not gonna build beyond Interstate 80 because we're viewing that as a perceptual boundary of the site. And we're not gonna build stuff that's around on the backside of the mountain that we can't see. So without further ado, let's go over into here. Here is our perspective. And I'm gonna turn this into parallel because we know it's a bad idea to model in perspective view. So we're gonna to go to an isometric view. There we go. We're gonna zoom out just a little bit here. Zoom extents, both of the, the right and left and front views. Um, and when we were zoomed in on this view before on the top, we saw that some of these are labeled in terms of the heights that they're at. So 1100 feet, 1150. So each one of these topographic lines represents 50 feet in elevation. Some of these islands that are here represent a increase in elevation that's insular to that plateau. Um, but these, these islands down here, this little hook down here, these little uh, nodules, all of those are a level of detail that's way beyond what we need to be modeling. So we're interested in this area. So let's make a site boundary and we'll make it a bright magenta color. And we'll put it on here just to kind of keep ourselves focused. There we go. Uh, I'm going to keep that locked as well. That way I don't move it around. So we'll focus in on these aspects. We have a little bit of the ponds, a little bit of the creek, a little bit of the overlook. All right. And now if I go to our, our parallel view, you'll see that it kind of looks three-dimensional because of the shading on that, but it's now our job to bring it up into three-dimensional form. I'm gonna just grab this and float our rectangle 
up off of that grid just a little bit and then lock it again. So this is the area that we're interested in looking at. And now what I'm gonna do is just get some vertical control on here. So from this edge, we're gonna go up 1100 feet and we could go up 1100 feet, but because this map starts out at a thousand feet above sea level, let's just make 1000 feet above sea level our zero. And let's start out at 100 feet. It's going to be a lot easier. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a series of construction lines at 50 foot intervals. I'm just going to set up a grid for myself. Now, you could do copy paste here. And each one of those is going to be 100 feet up. I might even want to put those on a new layer. Make those bright green. Remember, setting up your model carefully is really boring, but it's super helpful. Um, and then the rest of these, we're going to want to take down to 50 foot. So I can make just as many at 50 foot marks by doing that and then hitting O oh, snap and making sure that my midpoint is turned on right there. Snap it to the midpoint. You'll see that I'm putting double zero prefixes on my layers. And the reason for that is just so that they can I can stack them and keep um, keep the layers kind of organized. We're gonna change those. We're gonna change the layer of those 50 foot marks there. There we go. All right, so you can see there are my lines to snap height to in the right hand dimension. And now I can start to kind of set some heights for some pieces. Um, I'm gonna use that with a combination of this piece and this piece. So the first thing I'm gonna do is to try to set some of these heights. So we started out at a thousand feet as our zero. I'm gonna start by just making some rectangles that give me some baseline heights of things. So let's zoom in and find, there we go, 1400 feet. Let's find a thousand feet. All right, right here is a thousand feet. So I'm gonna make a square. I'm gonna snap it to that height right there. And you're gonna see, let's just do shaded. And you're gonna see it come in over here. Now, basically what I'm doing is I'm making a jig for myself. And again, a lot of preparation, just like in the wood shop, a lot of preparation of a jig will quickly allow you to kind of improvise a site as you practice this and get better at it. You can mock up a site. So, and this is very important. This is mock up for kind of like preliminary design or schematic design um, when you wanna go or something quick. And the reason why I'm teaching you guys this skill is because this is the first thing that you need to do when you're in a firm. This is not how to make an accurate site model. That usually engages other consultants. So what we're gonna do is make a jig. The jig takes a long time and then the rest of it flows together very quickly. So let's work our way up to 11, to 1050. I'm just gonna make another rectangle right there and I'm gonna snap it to 1050. And we're just gonna keep going up until we get to the plateau. And I'm just gonna walk my way up. Now, having a little bit of color differentiation for me, I find really helpful. That way, as things start to overlap, I can still keep track of them. And it's kind of, it's kind of dumb, but I'm just building stuff where it needs to go. This one's gonna be relatively small. I wanna make it actually a little bit bigger than it needs to be so that I can see it easier. All right, we just attached to blue, so we're gonna attach to green. And now we're at the top of the viewing at this lower spot. I'm gonna make this actually really big. I'm gonna make this almost the entire size of that site and attach it to this blue line. Okay, there we go. I'm gonna continue that as we go up this 
hill here. So we're going to go over to the 1400 spot right here. And we would keep going. Now you could do a lot, you could count, but I don't trust myself. So I would keep going all the way to these. So this is going to be 2000, 2000 feet up here. So I'm going to go to 2000, which is to here and then another. So we're going to need to do this spot there. And then I'm going to trace over top of it. And we're going to go up 1,000 feet, not 100, 1,000 feet. All right. And now if I look at my parallel projection, you can kind of see, and you can kind of see where the topography of that land is going to be. Um, I'm going to make a nut, one more reference guide for myself, zero, zero uh, reference. Actually, this is going to be a silhouette. Um, the other reason why I'm teaching you guys to do it this way is because the method that I'm showing you is really friendly for the CNC machine, and it creates a really fast model. More higher accuracy models that really use these topo lines to extract, to create a mesh, are really beautiful, but they're so heavy and complex that your computer spends a lot of time rendering just the landscape when you really want to spend it rendering your model. All right, so we're just going to use, uh, we're going to go out here. I'm going to go back to the front view. I'm going to zoom in. And we're going to take a spline. Through interpolating it through the points. And we're going to start down here and we're going to go to these points. All right, and that line change is going to be this reference silhouette. So you can see that black line, that gives us a view of what Big Pocono looks like. And that should look kind of like a Pennsylvania mountain. And this is really important because there are no Rocky Mountains in Pennsylvania, as far as I know. So this looks like a very kind of Pennsylvania looking kind of low gully, kind of wetlandy area of the Poconos with big, tall, rolling, shouldery mountains. I'm gonna make this a ridiculous color as well. We'll make it purple. And now what we're gonna do is the fun part. Now you can make as many of these as you're comfortable with. So for example, let's say that there's a lot of geographical strangeness going on in your site. This site that we've picked basically is kind of a whaleback. There's like a ridge where Camelback Mountain is. No wonder it's called Camelback Mountain, right? One hump, two humps. Got it. Got it. And there's a valley on this side and a valley on this side. Remember, we said that this was uh, this was Interstate 80. So let's make some really quick. So let's make I-80. Let's make. Um, the ridge, and I'm gonna put these in their own designation. And that's the reason why I leave like numbers. So I can I can collect stuff together. I can always make less layers, but it's, it's, it's nice to kind of be like, all right, I'm going to do Interstate 80 and the ridge and the wetlands. All right, let's make Interstate 80 bright red. Let's make the ridge uh, we already said it, we're going to make it purple. So we'll make it mm, bluish purple, lavendery purple. The wetlands will make a blue color. All right, so let's start out with Interstate 80 and we'll make a multi point rectangle. And it will just, and we're going to snap to the existing map and just grab Interstate 80 right here. 
We're gonna go the width of Interstate 80. And we said we we're gonna make it a big visual barrier. So let's just make a big visual barrier for ourselves. There we go. Now we will unmistakably remember that the noise of Interstate 80 is right there. All right, that's cool. Uh, let's make the ridge. Again, we're gonna go over here and do a three point, sorry, we're gonna do a three point rectangle. And let's grab the spine of that ridge all the way out to you know, this point here and make sure that we match the height on that piece already. There we go. Cool stuff. And we'll do some wetlands. I might do that and just, a, I might do that. Mm, no, we'll do it now. We'll do it now. So we're gonna activate the wetlands. And instead of doing a cube, I think I'm gonna do kind of an oval shape in this area and you'll see why momentarily. So we'll do a, not a cylinder. Should we do an ellipsoid? Maybe, yeah. All right, now we'll do a cylinder. Okay, and I'm gonna do it this to a height right underneath of this. Once I make that circle, I'm gonna copy it and move it around a little bit. All I've done so far Let's look at this. And if you guys want, you can screen capture it. So worst case scenario, you've just made a site diagram. Best case scenario, you have a jig for making a landscape. Most likely scenario, this is where you need to take a uh, break and go eat a tasty cake or dinner. And so you walk away from it and you come back later and you forget where you were but you've got your layers managed and organized and you have your site and all these pieces, you know that's Interstate 80 and that's really loud and you're ready to do the next thing. This is a good chance, time to save your file. All right, taste the cake break and we're back. Let's lock all of the files that we don't want to move, which is basically all of them. So we wanna to snap to them, but we don't wanna draw on them. We're going to do a brand new layer, layer 10, and we're going to say it's terrain. And we're going to make it a ridiculous mint green color because why not? And this is very key. I am going to use this shape right here. Now, if you're following along, it might be really, really tiny on your screen right now, but this is called ellipsoid. And I'm going to do ellipsoid from foci. Now, yeah, yeah, we're going to do ellipsoid from foci. All right, we're going to set terrain to be our. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the foci of this, and I'm going to make. We we were talking about these landforms before as being bean sausage pouch shaped. All right, they're kind of like. Um, they're kind of like blow up animal balloons. And as a matter of fact, that is the best way I can describe what we're gonna do. We are gonna make these landforms by move, moving together a bunch of kind of animal balloon type shapes. The objective is not to do big or small. The objective is to do it in an efficient amount. So remember, we want more detail over here where we already have more detail in the map. We want the most detail right here where we already identified that as our site. So to get the camel back, I'm going to make the foci of the camel back and we're gonna put that big blimp shape right there, right where it should be. And then I can dynamically squish it. And this is why I'm in a shaded view because as I dynamically squish the blimp, you can see that it starts to show the purple ridge of my jig coming through. And I can make the blimp even bigger by just repeating that ellipsoid shape. So let's do it again. From about here to about, I'm gonna turn ortho off. About here 
about that wide, it's a little too wide. And I can actually control the squish. Now, using the gumball, I'm just moving these down or up to try to hit some of those positions. I could add more of these pegs if I wasn't confident about where it's going. Now, notice that I'm gonna leave a big chunk of this flattened blimp over here, and I'm not even gonna worry about it because it's outside of the boundaries of this red box. The red box, that magenta box, is where we were gonna spend our time doing detail. Um, if I wanna see through some of this, we could do ghosted view. There we go. Now I can see through to some of my lines here. Um, I'm just gonna do a couple more practice blimps. It takes a little bit of time, but you'll get the hang of it. And you kind of just practice to get some of these shapes. Let's go in here, shall we? All right, so we'll do kind of a wide line here. And we can look at this and see if it's matching the curve. Now, if we go too wide, if we go too wide, let me, let me mess up on purpose. If we go too wide, you can see that we have encapsulated all of our pegs. So that's just, just pump that, we'll get rid of it. And instead we'll grab it again, make sure that we're attaching to the topo map, kind of go as wide as we think we can, and then stretch it in a vertical direction to try to hit that edge. And then I'm gonna turn off midpoints and go for ends. And yeah, trying to stick to this height. There, you can see that we're a little bit close, but mm, no cigar. So I'm gonna lower this down just to see where these edges are coming out. And you can see in our, in our drawing, let's just go back to our view here of the right side. Nope, sorry, the front side. Let's do a ghosted view. So you can see that we can even move stuff around just in an orthographic view like this, and just to kind of get a feel for that edge. So if you look down here, we actually have a pretty good hit of that hill, but we need to we need to hit crest a little bit more here. So we need to start that oval in. And basically what we're gonna do is just keep, um, well, I refer to this landscape making as blowing bubbles. So what we're gonna keep, do, keep doing is blowing bubbles. And what I like about this is that it's repetitive and so you can refine it as you move along. And it means that you can start really basic and you can get more and more fancy or you can pull back and it's no big deal. Go from here over to here, make it that wide. The other reason why this works in general is that this is kind of the shape that a lot of Pennsylvania is made up of. Um, and if you don't like, if you wanna get some different changes or angles, you can get even more complex by kind of rotating these pieces and moving them down a little bit. I'm just gonna keep on going. I'm gonna add a couple more bubbles here and then we're gonna turn it off and see if it's starting to look like a landscape that's believable. And this is also really important because for beginning design, for ideation, for early model making, what is important is that you're communicating the idea and that you're spending time working on, you know, working on refining the idea. If you spend too much time making your model extra super hyper accurate, you're gonna waste a lot of design time where you should actually be iterating worried that it's perfect when it's not. So I'm just gonna get these shapes in here. I'm gonna shrink them down a little bit more. There's no way that mountain's that big. All right, and we're gonna just get this hump right here where, where our student said that they wanted our site to be. So that's this oval shape right here. 
And actually, I can kind of fudge it a little bit, not by making it a really pudgy site, but by kind of making it not quite as tall, selecting it, grabbing it by the surface, and then floating that bubble up. Check that out. And kind of move it around. And as you guys can see, as it kind of fills or doesn't fill up or shades those rectangles, you got a pretty good sense of what that looks like. Let's go to a fully shaded view. There you go. Uh, we need a little bit more right down there. The other thing that it's nice is that it's actually starting to show where those wetlands are. Not too shabby. I'm almost done. There's one more, there is one more thing that I have to do. I'm not done yet, but let's just turn off the wetlands, Interstate 80, PADCNR map, We'll turn off all of our construction lines and our silhouette, turn off the ridge. What you can see is that we have this kind of oddly shaped kind of form here, kind of looks like some kind of weird spaceship. I'll turn on that PADCNR one more time. And I'm gonna add one more layer called table. You're almost done guys. Thanks for sticking with me. I'm gonna make a table for all this stuff to be on, which is gonna be right here. It's right underneath that. And I just cut some of these pieces. So we're just really gonna quickly Boolean these. Select the surfaces to subtract from. All those fellas tracked with, there we go. So that chops those guys off. Just do that again. It's just a little bit of model cleanup here. Hang in there, we're almost finished. So again, some good model making cleanup practices are important just to kind of decide like, all right, gives me a minute to think before I'm gonna do my next step. All right, and we're just Boolean difference this, select surface or poly surfaces to subtract from and to subtract with, and we're done. Okay, there we go. I can turn off PC, PA, DCNR. We're gonna activate the table. Change layer, put that on the table, and we're gonna do one more layer, 30, and this is called the drape layer and we're gonna make it pink. Okay. Zoom extents on all my windows. So we get ready for this new command. Now this is a command we have not used before. I'm gonna do a ghosted view and all of these. Drape command basically makes everything into a tablecloth and it drapes an imaginary tablecloth and it drapes it down onto your site. Drape is one of my favorite fast, down and dirty Rhino shortcuts. So what we're gonna do right now, in the plan view, we're gonna say drape. And it's gonna say drag a window over the area to drape. I am going to click that window inside the boundary of the table. Let me repeat that one more time. I'm gonna click this drape inside the boundary of the table and I'll show you why after I do it correctly. I'll do it wrong on purpose. So here's the drape. I'm gonna let it go. And here's what you're gonna see. If we look at the parallel view, what has happened is that we have draped a very fine mesh over the surface, like a vacuum table. And what this has allowed us to do is to create a simulacra of Camelback Mountain in one-tenth the time and one-tenth the model size. Hey, Andrew of a super accurate model. Yeah. Can you just do that one more time? You got it. This is my favorite command. I love this command. So we've made this really weird pudgy model, right? I've made this blocky table right here. We're gonna use the drape command, D-R-A-P-E. And the drape command says, drag a window over the area to drape. So what it will do 
is no matter what orthographic view you're in, it will make a mesh that falls. And as it hits objects, it will stick to them. So I'm going to use it in the plan view. And I'm going to drape across the tabletop. I'm going to stay, let's do top view here. I'm going to stay inside this tabletop for the drape command like this. All right, so I'm tracing just inside the table and I let go. You'll see that it makes this grid and then all these things get wrinkly. Let's go to the parallel view so you can see what it looks like. You'll see that there's a really fine mesh that it's built. And a mesh is not a solid object. A mesh, a mesh is a complex surface governed by a complex equation, but it's not solid. It's actually made of, not, it has no thinness. And you can see right here, it looks like this. Now, the more stuff that you add under it, just like a vacuum table, or if you ever like vacuum pack something, the more stuff that you add underneath the drape, the more definition it will have. So you can see that where there was some fall off around this egg shape right here, you can see that the drape just kind of falls in a way that, you know, that valley doesn't work. This means also that you can Boolean and scoop shapes out. So you don't just have to make these like inflated flat pancakes. You can scoop shapes out of other shapes as well. You could even do that. And the reason why I turned off Interstate 80, let me just move this one over here. If I turn on Interstate 80 and I go back to the drape command, I'm going to do two things wrong this time on purpose. So Interstate 80 is right here. I'm going to do the drape command. And I'm going to drag the window over the table, over Interstate 80, and I'm going to miss the table edge. I'm going to let go. And we're going to show you what that looks like. So in the parallel projection, you'll see how the drape command errored around both Interstate 80 and the table. So as I move this up, you'll see that it maxes out, but we've got this really weird shape. And as a matter of fact, it's complex enough that my, I can feel my computer slowing down a little bit. So let's just put these two next to each other so you can see what they look like. Orange, not the best color to kind of show them off, but let's do a shaded view. Let's do a, there. All right, so now you can see the pixelation in this one is a lot less. Whereas you can see that the pixelation in this one, there's some really big problems. Drape does not like extreme changes. It's really good at landscapes. It's really good at subtlety. It doesn't, it kind of freaks out when you try to do it over other stuff. Last thing I'm going to show you though, is that you can do this command called rebuild. And when you rebuild something, you can tell it to add or subtract um, more, um, more elements to it. So it'll simplify it. So you can see that this rebuild, let me just undo that again, let me make a copy of this. Nope, that, that is the command button. There we go. Let me make a copy of this. So this upper one is wrong on purpose. This one is not wrong, but I could probably make it better. So let's use the rebuild command. And I can say instead of a point count, so these UVs are these uh, these squares these squares that are here, and you can see as I increase them, it'll increase the amount of them. And I can say rebuild, and it'll rebuild instead of having a really fine mesh, it'll have a less fine mesh, and you can see that it becomes a more gently sloping site. Now I lose some of the definition that I had in my previous drape. And you can see I get this like wonky little like diagonal thing that's going on here. So let's, so sometimes it usually takes a little bit of trial and error. So let's try a rebuild that is maybe 20 and 20. That's a little bit better. I'm gonna do one more thing, show you guys. Again, this is like, this is the most down and dirty kind of shortcut to making a believable landscape. Um, you can drape a drape. So I'm going to show you what that means right now. Drag a window over the area right here. Should be able to grab it, move it off. And see that what you can get is that you can like you can kind of it's it's kind of like xeroxing a xerox 
sometimes it kind of makes the contrast better. Sometimes it makes it worse. Sometimes a copy of a copy is not as good. Um, a combination of these things with rebuild can give you a very nice gently sloping site. You can see that this is basically form work and then you vacuum pack a piece over top of it. Um, another thing that you can do if you are confused by the topo map, you could scale, once you bring in a topo map, you could scale in a, a JPEG of a satellite view. Um, remember that you can put in as many construction lines and silhouette lines as you'd like to try to like check your silhouette and these little orange pegs that we had put in. Let's just go back to a uh, shaded drawing, these little orange pegs. It ain't beautiful, but it's not about making it beautiful because the last thing we have to do is to put the cabin on here. I am not doing this in the cabin model itself. There's a really important reason for that, right? A completely different scale. So let's do the cabin at a bright, let's do it at a bright blue. Let's do a rectangle. We're almost done. All right, let's make the rectangle here. Uh, all right, our cabins are what, 15 feet by 15 feet? All right, that's how big one of the biggest cabins is. Let's put it on the site. Come on, buddy. Let's land him on the site there. So tiny, so tiny. Coming in for a landing, zoom selected. All right, and this is the other reason why we go about doing this is because you guys can see, it's really, really small. He's so tiny. That's Kelly's cabin right there, that tiny blue dot. I don't even know if you can see it if I do a rendered view. It's so small. So the other reason to make a site that's maybe a thousand square feet by a thousand square feet is that anything else doesn't matter. So oftentimes students will start making a really detailed site when all you really need is this view, that view. And here's the thing that I would do. I would go back to the diagram that we made at the very start where we said what the most important stuff is. And if you've modeled those things, it's time to move on. Save yourself the time and get back into your cabin model. If you've made your cabin model with all the parts and pieces and you've made your landscape model, you're ready to make a, to open a brand new third model and copy and paste those pieces in to see what they look like. In class on Wednesday, this is very doable to do between today and Wednesday. In class on Wednesday, we'll bring those things together. We'll start picking camera views, talking about detail and figure out how to tell the intangible story of the space that your cabin exists in. I'm going to stop the recording right there. Not yet, almost. There we go.